This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Middle East and Africa are top stories this morning. Treasury yields rise after Fed Governor Chris Waller says there's no rush to cut interest rates while inflation remains a problem. Ready to act. Japan's policymakers warn currency traders that they're standing by to stem the slide in the yen. Plus, Israel agrees to reschedule a cancelled visit to Washington to discuss possible military operations in Rafah. It's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Vani Quinn in Dubai. We are pre-PCE this Thursday, and it is the last trading day of the month and the quarter for most developed markets. So let's get into it and see where we are headed. Futures-wise, it looks like it might be lower. This, of course, comes in the wake of Chris Waller's comments to the effect that literally there is no rush. He gave a speech in New York Wednesday evening U.S. time entitled There Is No Rush and suggesting that he needs to see at least a couple of months more inflation data in order to be comfortable agreeing with starting to cut rates. Well, that also started to help Treasury sell off and we are up a couple of basis points here on the two-year yield at 4.6055. And then with Brent crude, we are seeing it hold in around the $86.30 mark. I do want to point out this chart, though, because we are at the end of the quarter. It's also the end of the fiscal year in Japan, so we'll be talking about that in a little bit. But have a look at this. Global stocks have risen for the second straight quarter as bonds slide. That blue box there, it's the all-country world index. Now, in that, Japan has done the best, followed, interestingly, by the Euro stocks 50 and then the S&P 500. And of course, the purple is our dollar spot index. And as we know, that's been strengthening as the Fed has been putting off its cutting cycle. Let's check in now on how markets in Asia are faring and that yen in particular. April Hong is in our Singapore studio. April. Yeah, Bonnie, we are focusing on the yen, but let's take you through what we're seeing in Asia-Pacific stocks first because we did get those hawkish comments from the Fed Governor Christopher Waller. So far, investors here seem to be taking things in their stride as we see the AI theme coming through. It's those tech-rich indices that are climbing, except the Nikkei. And we're seeing Honhai, the Taiwanese iPhone maker that also makes AI servers. That is surging to a record today. We've seen it doing well in the past month after it released strong quarterly earnings and a number of brokerages have upgraded its price target. So it's helping to lift not just the Taiwan stock benchmark, but helping to cap those declines on the MSCI Asia Pacific. Let's take you to Japan, where the Nikkei really is the laggard in the stock space today. And this is some... Uh, timing involved in this because yesterday was the last trading day before companies went ex-dividend. Today there's some profit taking underway but note how even though we're seeing this pullback it did close at near the record high yesterday. On the yen we're seeing it move roughly at that 151.4 level. It's steadying after hitting 34-year lows yesterday. We did get the BOJ summary of opinions from its meeting this month and they're advocating a cautious approach when it comes to rate increases. Bonnie. April, thank you so much. We'll be back with you in just a little bit. That's April Hong there in Singapore, keeping a close eye on the yen. Meanwhile, Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller says the central bank should delay or reduce the number of rate cuts seen this year. He called the recent inflation figures disappointing and said he wants to see at least a couple of months of better data on that front before cutting. Policymakers have penciled in three rate reductions still for 2024, but Waller says a strong U.S. economy and robust hiring have given the Fed room to wait. In my view, it is appropriate to reduce the overall number of rate cuts or push them further into the future in response to the recent data. I see no rush in taking the step of beginning to ease monetary policy. Let's bring in Deanna Mosina, Deputy Chief Economist at AMP. Deanna, thank you so much for joining. There was speculation that it was Waller that moved his dot in the summary of economic projections, such that now it's maybe more likely that we'll see two cuts rather than three this year. Is this confirmation of that fact, do you think? Well, the last few weeks of data, I think, would suggest that there probably isn't really a need right now for the Fed to rush into rate cuts. The growth environment is still holding up and inflation is trending down. So unless you get a change in the growth dynamics at the moment, you see a much further weakening in the labour market or qu quite a fast slowing in the consumer sector, I think the Fed probably does have room to wait just to get extra confirmation that inflation is heading down particularly for the services sector. 
So what you really want to see is softer wages growth from here. He made it sound a little more urgent than that, though, Musina, uh, Diana. He made it sound like it might be a dangerous thing, actually, to start the cutting cycle. Will we see the rates market price out a June cut today? Well, it's interesting because uh, he definitely sounded quite different in his rhetoric to what Powell sounded like in his testimony because, to me, Powell sounded like a central bank governor that was ready to start cutting so I mean, we have to remember that this is a board decision. Um, Waller and Powell are not the only ones that make this decision. It is uh, one that's decided by the whole board. So we can't just take comments from one person as what the whole Federal Reserve is going to do. I mean, I think it will impact market pricing, though, because we've seen over the past few months this shift towards pushing out those rate cuts later into the second half of this year. So we, we, we may see that happening again. But I don't think that Waller's comments override what, what Powell was saying just a few weeks ago, which to me seemed like a central bank that was getting ready to start easing. And let's not forget also that other central banks like in Sweden or in Canada are looking like they're ready to start cutting interest rates soon. I mean, that could be a sign for the Fed that it's time to move into that easing cycle as well. Possibly, for sure, but I think it's fair to say that Waller has been one of the more important voices, at least in the last year to 18 months, right? I mean, you know, as a Fed governor, you typically don't hear that much from somebody, but Waller has definitely been out there front and centre. I do want to ask you about today's mm. confidence data and tomorrow's PCE data. Will we get any surprises? Well, the PCE data has been coming in uh, below the Fed's own expectations in the past few months, and uh, the CPI data, I think, is mostly in line with uh, PCE that's trending towards that 2% uh, range for the federal inflation target. So I don't really think that we're going to see too many surprises, given that we've already had the monthly inflation data in terms of the consumer price index, which obviously leads what happens to the to the, uh, to the PCE numbers. I think just the bigger concern is we need to keep tracking wages growth. I like looking at the Atlanta Fed wages measure. That's still running at about 5% in annual terms. That's just way too high. You need to see wages growth closer to about 4% or so for the Fed to be comfortable. So it's really about breaking down some of those headline numbers to see what the components are. The Fed is certainly still looking at that super core or services inflation, if, if you want to call it that. Which hasn't been moving lower at all. Diana, can we move to a different mm. terrain now and ask you about the, the yen? Obviously, Japanese policymakers are finding it more urgent to come out and start signaling to the market that they are ready to intervene if it's necessary. Will mm. it be necessary before the end of the fiscal year, which is literally today? Uh, may, maybe not uh, literally before the end of today, but I think that there are, are obviously some growing risks that there will need to be some further intervention uh, in the currency market in Japan. And if not that, then maybe another small interest rate hike. I think a small interest rate hike is definitely on the cards for the Bank of Japan in the next few months and maybe a few more by the end of this year. But they will be just small tweaks because the Japanese inflation dynamics are nowhere near as strong as where they have been across some of the other major central banks. And Japan wants to tread carefully in trying to lift inflation, given that it's been problems in trying to get inflation high for the past few decades. So some further interest rate hikes would certainly help to see some to see some further rise in the currency in Japan. Could we get that as soon as April? I don't think it's likely to come uh, as soon as April. I mean, the Bank of Japan only just uh, lifted its interest rate out of negative out of neg negative territory recently, so we're probably likely to uh, wait another few months. But I mean, we obviously still have a lot of time to go before the end of the year and I think we will get some some small hikes to interest rates over the course of 2024 but they will be quite minor compared to what some of the other major central banks did I mean we're talking about uh you know 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 per per percentage moves rather than the 25 basis points that we're used to in countries like the Fed Canada Australia or the eurozone how much is it putting pressure on other central banks, Diana, that the Fed hasn't cut yet and really isn't signalling a cut anytime soon anymore? I mean, still signalling cuts this year, but not in April, May, June. Um, you know, Sweden's Riksbank, for example, keeping its rate at 4% yesterday too. I wonder if it's a little related. 
Well, I actually was looking at this uh, the other day in terms of how central banks move uh, compared to the Fed. And if you look at emerging market central banks, they some of them have already started to cut interest rates. They're normally the first ones that tend to move in the cycle, whether it's up or down in terms of changing interest rates. So just because the Federal Reserve hasn't cut interest rates doesn't mean that other central banks can't do that. I know we always tend to look at the Fed as a leading indicator for what's happening to data, particularly with inflation. But every economy has to manage its own inflation dynamics in its own domestic setting. So just because the Federal Reserve hasn't cut rates, I don't think necessarily means that we won't see a cut by the ECB, by the Bank of Canada or by the Risk Bank in Sweden. I think there's also a great possibility that we'll actually see a rate cut by the Reserve Bank in Australia. Uh, the Fed is definitely a leading guide for other central banks and probably other central banks want to look to what the Fed is saying, but they are still signalling a few interest rate cuts this year. It's just not as much as the market was pricing in uh, in December last year. Exactly. And of course, we have to see that PCE data as well. Maybe it will surprise us all. Deanna, thank you so much for giving us your time this morning. That's Deanna Mussina, Deputy Chief Economist at AMP. So ahead, why a UAE company says the electric car market has huge potential for growth in the region in the coming years. But first, Israel agrees to reschedule a delegation's visit to Washington to discuss a planned offensive on Rafah. Details next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. The White House says Israel has agreed to reschedule a cancelled visit to Washington to discuss possible military operations in Rafah. Joining me now is Bloomberg's Paul Wallace. Paul, thanks for joining. Do we know when this meeting will happen and why Israel suddenly agreed to reschedule? Hi, Vonnie. We don't know the date yet, but presumably it's going to happen quite soon. I think maybe, since, maybe in some way it was inevitable that this meeting would happen. Uh, yes, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancelled it um, earlier this week uh, in sort of retaliation for the U.S. abstaining from using its veto um, in a U.N. vote that called for an immediate ceasefire. But the... Uh, the U.S. was insistent that this, uh, they wanted this to take place because they want to discuss alternatives uh, to a full-on invasion or full-on offensive on Rafa, the city uh, in southern Gaza, with Israel. And this is, this is coming from the very top. This is something Biden himself wants. Uh, so presumably this meeting will happen um, perhaps within days. For sure. What new can the U.S. say to this delegation that might you know, help to change minds in Israel about a planned full-on invasion? This is a huge question because Israel is absolutely insistent that the uh, that an offensive on on Rafa must go ahead. Israel says that it's the last last uh, bastion of Hamas and that they're probably up to 8,000 Hamas fighters and uh, senior the group's most senior leaders in the city. The U.S. has saying is saying it certainly doesn't want a major uh, offensive. I think in all likelihood it wouldn't want an offensive of any kind, but it's probably going to spell out some kind of middle ground that it hopes uh, Israel will accept, something in between uh, a full-on assault um, and no invasion at all. So probably something like a, court, a, a more uh, um, a uh, sort of coordinated um, targeting of, of the militants in the city. And Paul, just to go back to the, the theatre of the war again, how serious was yesterday's Israel southern border of Lebanon clashes? We've seen lots, plenty of incidents like this since October the 7th um, and even uh, since the start of the year when tensions on Israel's northern border have, have, um, have gone up some more. However, this type of thing just adds to fears and concerns that Israel and Hezbollah will get into, if not a full-blown uh, uh, full conflict, something akin to that. Um, there were civilians killed on both sides of the border yesterday, around uh, seven or so in Lebanon, uh, according to the Lebanese authorities, and one civilian was killed in Israel. When civilians are killed as opposed to uh, soldiers or, or, or militants, um, that that is something um, that can escalate tensions. Paul, thank you so much. Always adding context for us on the Middle East crisis. That's Paul Wallace here in our Dubai studio. 
Well, ahead of this week's local elections, Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has hinted at a possible reconciliation with the country's Kurdish minority. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Turkey economy and government reporter Beryl Ackman. So, Beryl, why is the Istanbul vote of particular importance to Erdogan? Um, there are multiple reasons why this vote is so critical for Erdogan. Uh, just five years ago, the opposition won the Istanbul vote in a landmark victory. And that was really personal for President Erdogan because he himself started his political life in that city as a mayor in the 1990s. The city also has a budget of over $6 billion, so controlling it means access to a lot of financial means and funds and also to social aid, which has been critical for the government to shield its uh, citizens from a massive cost of living crisis with inflation soaring um, above 65 percent in recent months and even set to accelerate further. A win for the opposition uh, mayor, Ekrem Imamoglu, who has a seat now, um, is also seen as you know, him becoming a national challenger to add on um, at the national level um, in the future, so he could become Erdogan's uh, chief political opponent there as well. Beryl, do investors see any threat to economic policy normalization after the elections? There's no signal uh, from the government or from President Erdogan that he will change economic policy after elections. So investors really, in terms of economic policy shakeup, see this as a non-event. Uh, just yesterday at a rally, Erdogan said that he is behind his economic um, economic minister, economy minister, finance minister Mehmet Shimshek, who's been really at the helm of this U-turn uh, since last May when Erdogan got re-elected. Um, investors only say that in the case of an extreme election outcome in Istanbul, where, say, the opposition would win by a very wide margin, then maybe things could change. Uh, but they see that uh, happening as almost impossible, given that it's going to be a very tight race. We have, though, seen the lira come under pressure and a huge amount of volatility. One week implied volatility up 13 percent yesterday, Beryl. So what's the story there? Well, uh, yes, a lot of residents uh, across Turkey are worried that the lira will face a massive rout or see a very sharp depreciation after elections, because the main criticism that policymakers have faced is that they have been managing the currency even after a policy normalization since May. Now, policymakers themselves have said that they'll maintain a real appreciation of the lira and that the volatility is really temporary uh, given the elections and will subside after ruling out any sort of expectations or concerns of a sharp depreciation. Um, also, a uh, February inflation print that was worse than expected has contributed uh, to increased demand for hard currencies, putting Lira under more pressure. Beryl, thank you so much. That is Bloomberg's Beryl Ackman there joining us from Istanbul. Stay with us. Plenty more still ahead right here on Bloomberg Middle East and Africa. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. Nissan says it's confident its, quote, China for China strategy of developing EVs locally is the right one for that market. The company's senior vice president told us more about balancing regional strategy while competing globally. Have a listen. Regional size is what matters. Uh, China for China at Nissan is uh, something that's working uh, very well. And uh, we will be launching in China over the next few years. Uh, four new uh, energy vehicles completely developed, localized uh, in, uh, and, uh, and uh, produced, obviously, by our, by our Chinese for China business. And then elsewhere uh, in the U.S., in Europe, uh, or in our Japan business, we're trying to leverage global scale where it works or regional scale where it can. We've got a very big presence in North America, both in U.S., Canada, and in Mexico. And uh, and there's enough volume to generate, again, the economies of scale to be competitive. And being competitive just means bringing the cars at the right price for the customers to be uh, very happy with those. The question that Lisa asked, though, I think is a really important one. And it plays into this discussion that we are having. Can you generate global scale 
when it feels like these markets are becoming increasingly regional. And you mentioned the regional effort. I want to understand, and I'll ask you direct, what happens if we get the former president coming into power and he doesn't just put big tariffs on what's happening in BYD and with Chinese automakers in Mexico. He does it across the board, puts the walls up and shuts everything down. If we shut down the global auto market, it becomes heavily regionalized. Does it change what you do or do you think the market was already moving in this direction? I think the market is moving. I mean, with COVID and the semiconductor crisis, we've been uh, obviously uh, much more knowledgeable and careful as to how the logistics routes are uh, set up uh, across the industry. Uh, we've been thinking about uh, dual sourcing and uh, more insuring of the activities. And so that's a trend that, you know, we want to continue building where you sell is uh, a recipe for success uh, in, the, in this industry. And so we are obviously very committed to uh, making investments in North America that will, uh, that will uh, help manufacture all the vehicles that uh, will be sold here. Nissan Motor SVP Jeremy Papin speaking with our colleague Jonathan Farrow there. Well, coming up, why a UAE company says that the electric car market has huge potential for growth in the region in the coming years. We'll be speaking with that executive next. You don't want to miss that. First, let's take a quick look at how Middle East markets fared yesterday. In general, financials continuing to be weak in the session. Take a look at the DFM General Index. Well, it was down for a second day, down about 0.3%, as you can see. Uh, there, Mashrak Bank contributed most to the decline. Abu Dhabi's General Index, it was down for a third day, down about a half a percent. First, Abu Dhabi Bank contributing most there. And then if we move across to Saudi Arabia, the Tadawal, that rose after three days of decline, so bucking the trend in the region of about 0.2%, so a slight gain. But of course, that index is up 20% in the last year. So those last few sessions have taken a few percentage points off those gains, but nevertheless, doing pretty well for itself in the region. Qatar's Q index, well, it fell for a third day. And again, Qatar Islamic Bank contributing to that decline. So financials really suffering in the region yesterday. That index down 0.7%. Let's take a look at futures, though, as we head into the final trading day in March and a quarter, and for Japan, at least, the fiscal year. We are pointed lower, but very, very fractionally for U.S. futures. This after, of course, the S&P bucked the downtrend for the week yesterday and actually rose. And for Eurostoxx 50, it looks like it might be an up day. Plenty more still ahead. Do stay with us. This is Bloomberg Middle East and Africa. This is Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. Treasury yields on the rise after Fed Governor Chris Waller says there's no rush to cut interest rates while inflation remains a problem. Ready to act, Japan's policymakers warn currency traders they're standing by to stem that slide in the yen. Plus, Israel agrees to reschedule a cancelled visit to Washington to discuss possible military operations in Rafah. It's just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. And a few things on the market calendar today. We do have economic data today, including consumer confidence. But that PCE data, which comes out tomorrow after markets close for the quarter, that's what's really on traders' minds. Of course, we did see the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq buck some declines for the week yesterday. The S&P had an update to the tune of 0.9%. The Nasdaq 100 to the tune of 0.4%. Looks like we are pointed fractionally lower, very fractionally for U.S. markets in the very early going. We did see some Treasury selling, though, because that speech from Fed Governor Chris Waller happened in the U.S. evening time yesterday. Bond futures are pointed lower as well, with yields potentially on the rise a little bit today, as it looks like markets might start to price out a June rate cut after those comments. The speech was literally titled, There is no rush. As you can see, the two-year yield at 460.75. And then we're keeping an eye on crude as well. Brent crude back up to 86.35 a barrel. I want to point out this chart, though, because we do 
have to take into uh, consideration that we are at the end of the quarter and for Japan it's actually the end of the fiscal year it's the final trading day in the fiscal year Japan did the best out of all markets in the quarter as you can see that blue line there is stocks the all country world index in fact but Japan did the best in that followed by euro stocks 50 and then the S&P 500 and of course the purple is the dollar spot index as we know the dollar has been holding on to strength as price cuts keep getting priced out for the FOMC. We're not quite sure when that cutting cycle will start. But we are keeping a very close eye on the yen today after policymakers told traders basically what was on their minds. Let's get more now from Avril Hong in our Singapore studio. Avril. Yeah, Vani, we've been talking so much about the Japanese currency. I thought I'd recap what we've been seeing in the past three months. As we headed into the year, there was speculation rife that the BOJ would finally exit negative rate policy because inflation was creeping back into the economy. But disaster struck at the start of the year and a natural disaster prompted traders to pull back their bets that we see an imminent move from the BOJ. We saw the yen moving from 140 towards 150. The BOJ hiked last week and dovish signals last week as well as this week sent it from the 150 towards the 152 level. Uh, we're seeing that yield differential also a big factor in all this amid hawkish Fed speak. Uh, we're seeing that weakness on the Japanese yen. It is the worst performer in the G10 this quarter. Now, from an underperformer, I'll take you to an outperformer. Let's take a look at how Xiaomi, the Chinese tech name, is faring. It's been outpacing Chinese tech peers and the Hang Seng tech. Uh, and this is an $8 billion stock rally that we've been seeing a lot at stake as it unveils its EV model today. Uh, and it will have to deliver in order to justify its stock performance. Bonnie. Avril, thank you so much. We'll be checking in with you for the next few hours, particularly on the end. That's Avril Hong there in Singapore. The electric vehicle market has been plagued by slowing sales, but weaker demand doesn't mean progress is stalling. Bloomberg New Energy Finance says the share of global passenger vehicles from EV-only manufacturers has risen from just 1% in 2020 to 7% last year. Let's discuss the future of EVs in the Middle East region now with somebody who knows a lot about the subject. Hassan Ergiz is Managing Director of Dubai-based al Futsame Electric Mobility Company and he joins us now in our Dubai studio. So you've recently opened new v EV showrooms in Saudi Arabia in particular. Tell us a little bit about how that happened. It's a new project for you. Yes. So thanks for having me on and then uh, I'm glad to share the, all the insights about the electric vehicle market. It's very dynamic at the minute. Mm. It's, uh, it's really for us in two different dimensions. If we look at the, um, the, the, the consumer insights, the consumer interest, it is ever growing in our region, both in UAE in, and in KSA. In the KSA particularly, and one of the reasons why we are very optimistic about the opportunity is that if you look at the different uh, surveys, up to 80% of the customers are saying in KSA they are willing to consider electric vehicle as their next purchase. So, and right now, if you look at the sales rate adoption is less than almost 1% in KSA, that represents an incredible opportunity of the growth in this market. Well, it is very fascinating because it's quite a congested city, Riyadh, for example, Jeddah, where you've also opened a showroom, yeah. but you've done this without a local partner. Talk to us about that. It's a whole new world, it seems like. Yeah, we are Alpha Team, uh, part of the Alpha Team Group. Alpha Team Group is the more than 90 years uh, in operation in GCC and beyond, and we have been in Saudi for a long time also for our other businesses, like the retail and like the, uh, the commercial uh, construction equipment business as well for many, many, many years. So for us, we consider ourselves as a also local uh, in the market. Passenger cars business was the one is the missing link for us. Uh, so we are very happy to be part of it, and also with our logistics companies with our retail experience also developing further uh, the passenger car business with the strength of our group in the in present in Saudi as well now Saudi is also investing in its own EV research and also manufacturing and sales how do you see yourselves fitting in in terms of competition with Saudi Arabia in order to unlock the full potential of the electric vehicle adoption you need competition 
and we would only welcome uh, Saudi governments and then the semi-government companies' investments on, on, on the uh, new companies. And uh, we are also bringing another uh, brand, uh, number one uh, in the new, new energy vehicle, BYD. And uh, I think with the choice of the different models, different technologies, and different uh, availabilities. This is the way to unlock, so it's, uh, I find it a very good insight. Tell us a little bit more about expansion possibilities in the region more broadly, and we are seeing a huge influx of populations from the likes of China, from Russia, and from other countries as well, including countries in Europe, and that would pre present opportunities, I'm sure. Yeah. So especially if you look at in the UAE, the population, more than 85% is the, as we call it, expatriates or foreigners. They are coming with the entire the rest of the world and they are bringing their own consumer behaviors and the habits and then the insights. So it makes it in a very dynamic and interested, interesting markets. And especially also in our Saudi is, uh, has a huge vision to attract more uh, foreigners to the, uh, to the kingdom. And this is obviously bringing a very uh, vibrant, very dynamic, and very well-versed uh, markets, and that also requires the same from private companies to cater all these needs. Do you have any figures that you have in mind or any goals that you'd like to attain? Um, so we made our pledge uh, when we set up our companies a year ago. We said that in the UAE, we will be by 2030, as a group, automotive group, we will be selling 50% of our entire portfolio as the electrified vehicles. And also we will contribute to the complete electric vehicle infrastructure by 10% of the entire nation. And similarly, when we launched in, in the kingdom four weeks ago, we made a similar pledge. We said that 50% or even more, 100%, we can go in Saudi with the electrified. And also, we will invest in the local workforce. We will hire the local people, upscale them, train them to prepare them of the new generation of the future. I love the ambition. 100% <laughs> is, is quite the ambition. Yeah. A little bit about green financing, because it's very in vogue at the moment. Yeah. Is there any opportunity for you to tap those markets, debt or capital markets? Um, we are, uh, we are as a, a, a family company mm -hmm. and uh, we have been putting a very strong investment case for both in UAE and, and, and KSA in any future markets. So my role is actually to unlocking this growth and then the, the pushing for, for this. So this is what we are, I am focusing on right now. So no plans to actually tap those markets? So this is uh, something maybe it's better you may talk with our CFO, yes. but uh, this is my role is just the unlocking the growth that we see as a, as a magnificent opportunity for both markets and across GCC. How does it impact Alphutain Mobility Company that it's now no longer necessary in the UAE to have a local partner? Does that impact you as sort of the, the, the vice versa of what's happening with you in Saudi Arabia? Uh, Again, as I mentioned to you, especially for emerging technology for like the electric mobility, you need more partners, you need more uh, world class uh, companies and then the established businesses to come into here. So we absolutely welcome this openness to any competition to enter because at the end of the competition with the availability of the models, the price, uh, affordability, the consumer will win and adoption will happen. I have to ask you about tastes. What are people here and in Saudi Arabia looking for when it comes to electric vehicles? What are the more popular ones? So here, obviously, due to in UAE, due to the makeup of the country, the, the range that the consumers drive in a daily basis is, is a bit smaller. So therefore, they are looking a lot on the uh, full electric vehicles, but uh, we are also offering the second technology, which is the plug-in hybrid, as we call it, best of both worlds, which is an uh, electric uh, motor and the battery in it. it you can drive uh, more than 100 kilometers, and, and also with the combined engine, it costs up to 1,000. So we see that in Saudi, due to uh, the, the, the country and the distances are begin, being longer, we see the more interest to our plug-in hybrid technology, which is a transition to the full electrification in the, in the country. We well, can't wait to follow the progress, and thank you so much for sharing all of your goals and ambitions with us today, and congratulations on the expansion in Saudi thank Arabia. You. That's thank Hassan Nergiz, Managing Director of Al Futaim Electric Mobility Company. Plenty more is still ahead. Stay with us on Bloomberg Middle East and Africa. So that's all.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. South African billionaire Patrice Motsepe is in talks with Vivendi's Canal Plus to join its bid for the broadcaster MultiChoice. Bloomberg understands the French media company is looking to make a formal offer early next month. For more on this story now, let's bring in Bloomberg's Ondira Oganga, who joins us from Johannesburg. So, Ondira, what's the significance of Patrick Motsepe joining into this bid? Mm -hmm. Vonnie, Patrice is one of the richest black men in South Africa, and so bringing him on board helps Vivendi meet South Africa's stringent black ownership requirements. Um, and this stems from an affirmative action dubbed Black Economic Empowerment that requires that foreign companies are owned at least 25% by black people. And this was to promote inclusion of black people in the workforce and also labor force and drop them into economic activities. It's a good deal for Vivendi because it enables them to meet that regulation requirement but also it's a good deal should Patrice take it because one it diversifies his wealth portfolio but then again it started to be one of the biggest BEE deals in South Africa we understand that they'll be making a formal offer that is set to be drafted in the next couple of days and sent to MultiChoice. Just to jog your memory, they were offering 125 rands per share, valuing the whole company at $2.9 billion. And so the independent board will consider it in the next couple of weeks and will know if they like it or not. Well, should this offer be accepted, what does it mean for Vivendi? It's good for diversification and expanding their footprint across Africa. Vivendi through Canal Plus has a great footprint in Francophone Africa, but MultiChoice opens them up to 50 countries across Africa. Canal Plus brings on board 8 million subscribers. MultiChoice brings on board 23 million subscribers. And combined, they're hoping to grow to about 50 million subscribers, investing in local content and also investing in sports. And um, Vivendi has made it very clear that they want to take on the global giants uh, like Disney and Netflix. And by doing this, they'll be giving themselves an upper hand. Um, MultiChoice has Showmax, which is the leading streaming platform in Africa, ahead of Netflix with 2.1 million subscribers. And Netflix comes second with 1.8 million subscribers. Well, it seems to be moving along. We are continuing to follow the story. Ondiro, thank you. That's Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga in Johannesburg. For more coverage from the continent as well, tune into our monthly special, Africa Amplified. We'll be focusing on cocoa this month as the key chocolate ingredients historic rally hits all-time highs. That's next Friday, April 5th at 8.30 a.m. Dubai time, Africa Amplified. Plenty more is still ahead today. This is Bloomberg Middle East and Africa. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. The waters off Oman are emerging as a hot spot for ship-to-ship -ship transfers of Russian oil headed to India. Bloomberg ship tracking shows a fourth tanker since February transferred its load of Russian crude this week to a vessel near Oman. For more, let's bring in Asia oil trading reporter Elizabeth Lowe. So Elizabeth, why are the waters off Oman becoming a hot spot for oil transfers? Hey, Vani. Yeah. So um, I think this is a sign that there's um, increased scrutiny on Russian oil trading and that's beginning to take a toll on its uh, supply chain. So uh, as you said, ship tracking is showing more Russian oil heading to the port of Sohar in Oman uh, before being transferred by ship and moving on to India. So uh, this development is pretty interesting because the port of Sohar doesn't typically import a lot of crude. Uh, and that's also a pretty popular spot, uh, well known in the oil community for ship to ship activity, which um, is also often associated with uh, the need to mask illicit uh, activity in oil. So um, the situation is coming on the back of a pretty in uh, interesting development, right? Uh, last week, we saw um, Indian oil refiners saying they will no longer accept uh, cargoes of uh, oil of tankers belonging to Russia's state-run uh, soft comp flot. Um, and that's becoming uh, and that's becoming an issue because, of course, uh, Indian oil refiners are a big buyer of Russian oil. They're the second largest con uh, customer after uh, China. So um, I think it really highlights a, a big issue that's going on in oil right now, and that's the increased scrutiny of Russian oil uh, trading flows. So people are watching that.
it d definitely seems like there is a lot more scrutiny now. So how might it impact oil markets and pricing in particular? Uh, I think that's a question everybody is still watching. Um, it's been a pretty... Uh, it's been a pretty important development in the backdrop um, and people are looking at how the U.S. is taking action on uh, Russian tanker companies, Russian flows, uh, price caps. Um, so uh, these events are quite vital right now. Uh, of course, if there is a significant hit to Russian oil supply, supply chains, um, it could affect their exports. Uh, and I think people are watching to see uh, what alternative flows could come up or what other trading activities that could, could, could that could come up uh, because of this yeah it's fascinating we are definitely going to continue to monitor this story elizabeth thank you so much that is bloomberg's elizabeth Lowe. and while we're at it let's take a look at where we are in terms of oil pricing right now as i said there was a little bit of softness to brent yesterday after we got word that stockpiles were pretty high and that's actually coming back again today brent is trading above 86 dollars a barrel as you can see 86.35 same for nymex nymex crude oil above 81 dollars 81.70 right now up four tenths of one percent so we're continuing to see some strength in oil markets in spite of stockpiles. Well, on the same topic, for months, the Houthis have attacked vessels in the Red Sea in retaliation for Israel's military actions in Gaza. A 50,000-ton cargo ship called True Confidence was targeted earlier this month. Three seafarers were killed in that particular attack in what is now a deadly new era, it seems, for the international shipping industry. For more on this story, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Verity Ratcliffe. So, a new era in the sense that people were actually killed this time around, as opposed to all of the other attacks in which there didn't seem to be any casualties. What does it mean in terms of the Red Sea and, you know, standing out in particular, this particular attack? Well, like you say, this particular attack stands out because of the deaths on board. Three people died um, and two others had uh, life-changing injuries. Um, and this is the first uh, such attack that's resulted in these deaths um, on board. But it also stands out as well because the crew actually had to abandon ship. Uh, the ship was on fire um, and the crew had to flee onto essentially dinghies. The, um, the life uh, rafts were only available because the lifeboats were um, affected by the um, impact of the uh, missiles from the, the Houthis. Um, and the, the, it also stands out because it had such a difficult process getting into a, a safe haven. Um, you have to send in a, a salvage crew to go and pick up this vessel into essentially a, a war zone. And it was incredibly difficult. And I mean, the attack happened on the 6th of March and the vessel is still being towed to safety now. There's a timeline of events in your story and it's really incredible. I mean, this, this had to be painstakingly done by this rescue vessel. And they even had to fend off attacks on their own vessel, right? And then when they finally get there, there are things like barbed wire that this, these crew members have to get over. It's really inc an incredible rescue story if you like but what does it mean for what will happen next in the region because clearly efforts to secure the red sea by other countries have not worked absolutely um i mean the the perceived risk of that transit um waterway is 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 much higher um perhaps the actual risk is is the same we've seen attacks consistently over the past few months but just the fact that um this has resulted in deaths on board um, it definitely raises the perception of that risk and that can affect crews, which um, a vast majority of, of crews uh, are in unions and they have protections allowing them to d decline a route if they feel that it isn't safe. Um, so it could affect crews, it could affect the shipping industry as a whole. Um, already the, the transit through that route is 70% down, it could go even lower. Yeah, and I mean, we had seen you know, container shipping prices really escalate and then they've been pretty volatile over the last couple of months. I'm just curious as to how it will affect the shipping industry more broadly. Absolutely. Costs are a huge issue. Um, if you don't go through the Red Sea and the, the Suez Canal, you have to go all the way around uh, the southern tip of Africa. That adds a huge amount of costs. It affects um, delays to shipping, which impacts everything that um, arrives by ship. From grains, oil, absolutely everything that gets um, transported by ship. All right, Verity, thank you. I'd urge everyone to read the story. It really is a phenomenal story of how a rescue happened in very, very, very difficult circumstances. That's Verity Radcliffe there.
Well, let's take a look at where we stand futures-wise. It is the last trading day in most developed markets and most emerging markets for the quarter. We are looking at a down day in terms of futures in the US, but futures in Europe pointed to potentially a higher open at the very least. But we're talking very fractional legs lower there for US futures. All eyes will be on what happens in the Treasury market, I would say, today after Chris Waller's comments yesterday evening US time, in which he said basically there is no rush. That was the title of his speech. What he was saying was he wants to see at least a couple of more months of softer inflation data in order for him to be comfortable agreeing with going ahead with a cut. So that means that the possibility traders will start pricing out a June Fed cut. After all, we know that the likelihood of three cuts this year has gone down, at least according to the Fed's dot plot. And now it's sort of on the cusp of between two and three. So will the market reprice to that after today? We'll see. There we have uh, U.S. Treasury yields right now for 60.75. So we did go up a couple of basis points from yesterday and on the 10-year for 2061. Let's take a look at oil markets. As I said, strength in the oil markets in spite of continuing stockpiles. 86.36 for Brent, 81.70 for NYMEX. Do continue to stay with us. We have plenty more still ahead. Jennifer Zapazaja joins me next from Johannesburg for Bloomberg, Middle East and Africa. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. Treasury yields rise after Fed Governor Christopher Waller says there's no rush to cut interest rates while inflation remains a problem. Ready to act. Japan's policymakers warn currency traders they're standing by to stem the slide in the yen. Plus, Israel agrees to reschedule a cancelled visit to Washington to discuss possible military operations in Rafah. All that and more this morning. It is just past 9 a.m. across the Emirates, 7 a.m. here in Johannesburg. I'm Jennifer Zapasaja. And I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. And it's a big day today, Jen, the last day of trading for many markets and, of course, the pre-PCE day. But there's something else going on today as well that we can't forget to mention. Perhaps the biggest event of them all. A little birdie tells me it's uh, somebody's birthday today. <laughs> it is, yes. Did somebody tell you that? I don't know how that well, slipped out, mine. Bonnie. Yes, today uh, yes. is my birthday. <laughs> It is my birthday, and it is a big day uh, for many people, of course, uh, because we mentioned it's the last trading day of the quarter. It's also the last day before a long weekend for a lot of people. Uh, but thank you, Vani, for mentioning that. <laughs> Well, I hope you get lots of chocolate this weekend, even more than, than <laughs> usual, and I'm sure you'll get lots of flowers and all sorts of nice presents. You totally deserve it, and have a wonderful and happy birthday. Wow. I guess it's we do nice have to, to talk about you. the markets as well. So let's take a quick look <laughs> at where equity index futures stand, at least uh, in terms of U.S. futures. We might be looking at a down day, or at least just taking a little breather, and perhaps doing nothing much at all of anything before we get the PCE data. We do get confidence data out of the U.S. today as well. But we did have an update for the S&P 500 and NASDAQ yesterday after some straight days of declines. So that was a little bit of a breather for investors who've been waiting for that to happen. The S&P was up nine-tenths of a percent, and the NASDAQ was up four-tenths of one percent. In spite of NVIDIA really just dragging on the NASDAQ, it was down two and a half percent for a second day of declines for NVIDIA. And then after Waller, we did see the two-year yield futures wise it's up bond prices down we'll see how that plays out in today's trading 46075 on the two year right now yeah, Vani. Uh, Waller's comments, very interesting there. Uh, let's take a look at some other assets that we've been paying close attention to uh, throughout the quarter. Uh, I want to start with uh, Brent crude and oil, of course. Uh, as we can see, definitely uh, an up day right now for both Brent crude and WTI. Uh, Brent crude at about 86.39. Uh, and we're seeing oil really head towards a solid quarterly gain at largely. Uh, that is because expectations that OPEC plus supply cuts will tighten the market. That's coming even uh, despite 
despite the stockpiles that we've been talking about for the past few weeks. Bitcoin also pulling back slightly from what we saw uh, over the past few weeks, but at about uh, just over $69,743 there. Uh, some strategists, though, and investors, it's very interesting to hear what they're saying. Some people are saying uh, the boom has gotten out of control. Uh, BlackRock's Larry Fink, though, noted that he was surprised uh, in the rally that we've seen. So we'll have to see whether or not that continues in the second quarter. And just speaking of rally, uh, I just want to take a look at some of these assets that we've been paying close attention to uh, over the past few weeks that have really uh, are really ending on a high, as that chart uh, there shows. Bitcoin, gold, and of course, cocoa, uh, which we've been talking about for a number of weeks. Again, uh, we'll see whether or not that momentum continues into the second quarter. All right, let's check in, though, on how markets in Asia are faring. Avril Hong is standing by in our Singapore studio. Hey, Avril. Hey, Jen. Yeah, we're seeing a pretty mixed bag in the Asian session today. Almost uh, opposite trend from what we saw yesterday when Japan was leading the charge. Chinese equities were languishing. We saw CSI 300 Hang Seng close with losses of about 1 plus percent today. It seems that extreme pessimism is easing off a little and the Chinese gauges are climbing. We're seeing the Nikkei underperforming in the region. Yesterday it was a lot to do with how it was the last trading day before companies went ex-dividend. Today there's some profit taking on the way. Let's flip the board and take a look at how the Nikkei has been performing this quarter. It has has been outpacing gains in many of the major benchmarks globally. And this is a lot to do with the cheap yen, uh, corporate governance improvements, the economic revival underway in Japan. Uh, and this seems to be also what is continuing potentially into uh, the next quarter. It is those fundamentals that remain intact. Can't say the same for the Japanese currency, though, because it is the worst performer in the G10. Uh, intervention chatter is helping to cap those declines today, but we have hawkish Fed speak that I'm sure is not helping. Guys. Well, April, let's continue to talk about that. That's April Hong in Singapore. As April mentioned, hawkish speak, Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller is saying the central bank should delay or reduce the number of rate cuts seen this year. He called the recent inflation figures disappointing and said he wants to see at least a couple of months of better data before agreeing to cut. For more on markets, let's bring in MLive strategist Mark Cranfield. So, Mark, it seems like Waller might have been the person who shifted the dot plot slightly in favour of two as opposed to three cuts. Might we see the market reprice that in today? and maybe start pricing out a June rate cut? Yeah, I think it's been, it's been going on for a few days, actually. He's adding to comments that we heard from Mr Bostick just a couple of days ago, and gradually you can see traders are taking away some of those expectations. We've even got people in the options market who are now betting there won't even be a June interest rate cut from the Federal Reserve. We've got a lot more Fed speakers coming up in the next two weeks. There's a lot of hot data as well, as you were mentioning. PCE is one of them, got ISM as well. And there's a few others which will be thrown in there. So if you're looking for reasons why people would want to dial back on their expectations for the Federal Reserve, there are plenty coming up in just the next few days. Jerome Powell will be speaking, but he seems to be getting outweighed here by the number of Fed people questioning whether three cuts are really necessary or whether they can even do it while the data is too strong in the United States. And this is obviously feeding into how people feel about different asset classes, especially about the US dollar. As you were mentioning earlier, dollar yen is still very high, still above 151, even though we've heard a variety of speakers out of Japan saying they're, they're concerned at the pace of the yen weakness. Yeah, it's really fascinating uh, seeing how uh, the markets are really interpreting, interpret, interpreting these comments. Uh, Bloomberg's Mark Cranfield. Mark, thanks so much. Let's continue this conversation, though, uh, and bring in June Bay Liu. Uh, she's the portfolio manager at Tribeca Investment Partners. So, June Bay, uh, let's just start here uh, and pick up where we left off with Mark. How are you interpreting Waller's comments, and is it making you rethink your strategy in terms of your portfolio? Look, look, I think the comment itself is very much in line with, um, you know, on more rational expectations. You know, we have always thought it was uh, completely irrational last year for the uh, market to start pricing in rate cut from March and June onwards. And, you know, clearly the market in uh, March didn't happen. And from June onwards, we think it's just way too early. The data point so far has shown that the um, economic reality is pretty strong. Um, now, the market is still pricing in some cut further down the track. 
for this year, still a couple of cuts are uh, pricing in. Um, you know, my view is that it is still very, um, you know, still very ambitious for us to tr achieve those cuts, uh, given we do have U.S. election latter part of this year and the Fed is likely to stay out of the market. Um, so, you know, as an investment strategy, we are buying insurance policies. We do think that, um, you know, that, that the market is a little bit too uh, ambitious in terms of how many rate cuts we will see this year. Junbei, why would the Fed not move, you know, in an election month or the previous month or the previous month before that if we do see inflation data coming in? I mean, it would be dangerous for the economy not to start moving at that point, wouldn't it? Look, I think the latest, um, you know, we do have a small window that they will have to move, which is probably between July. Well, if June is not going to be likely, we think that's way too soon. It's July, August um, and potentially September. But look, I think it's very unlikely for them to do anything after Labor Day uh, in September, um, just because it's getting way too close to election. They wanted to see, to be seen that they are not, um, you know, politically charged and they want to stay away from all the noise, the political noise that will pick up by then. So, you know, my view is that you have a couple months of opportunity, window of opportunity. We do need to see the data to really pull off very quickly for us to get there, though. So, you know, as an investor, we play that probability thinking it's probably getting closer to less than the three, three rate cut is probably clearly unlikely. Um, you know, even two rate cut, I think it's probably too ambitious at this stage. When we think about globally, Junbei, in terms of uh, these comments and whether or not or when the Fed is actually going to cut, uh, reverberating around the, the world, we heard Avril Hong talking about the yen and, and the effect of Waller's comments on the dollar-yen cross. I mean, where do you think we're going to see this really having the biggest impact right now? Look, I think the rate cut, um, the indication, I think, you know, ultimately taking a step back, it's actually not how many rate cuts and the like. Um, it's really about the direction of the rate, um, the rate, uh, the, the interest rate. And we know it's going lower. Um, you know, with the direction of interest rate going lower, um, it sends a very a reasonably positive signal um, to global asset value. And I think, you know, with that comfort, um, you know, around the world, the asset value will remain stable. Um, and, um, you know, whether it's two cuts or whether it's one cut, um, you know, regardless, we know the interest rate cu cut is coming. So that puts a lot of uh, comfort, actually, around the world for asset prices. You know, I think the bond market is pricing it wrong. Uh, but I do think, you know, for other asset class, such as equities, that we see a lot of opportunities on the basis of that. Where would you see those opportunities? I was reading some Bloomberg Intelligence reporting today talking about how if you exclude the top seven firms like Apple and NVIDIA and so on, the S&P trades at about 19 times earnings as compared to 21 times earnings for the full index and that does present some opportunities where there's discounting. Yeah, look, absolutely. Look, I do think the top seven is very expensive, but there is some thematic that you do need to play. AI is hard to catch, and then there's only a very li limited number of companies who can play that. So that's scarcity value, and perhaps you should be there. But real, a lot of um, you know value and cyclical companies where is where you see opportunities. Um, you know, when we talk about the interest rate potentially heading lower, uh, if whether it's one or whether it's two, um, you know, it is very positive for cyclical or you know uh, economic sensitive sectors and where they currently are trading a much, much cheaper valuation. Um, also, you know, if you take a um, notice towards, um, you know, China as well, you know, it's coming off a very, very low base and there's no investor interest at the moment in that market. Um, it certainly represents um, opportunity on that basis. So, you know, we would say as active manager, we see opportunities everywhere, um, but it's really just to be selective for where to go. You know, I do think 2024 is going to be a year where, you know, active managers, where you're selective about your, um, you know, investment opportunity, you will make a lot of return. But on the index level, you probably generate still positive, but probably a little bit more volatile uh, to get there. Well, and Junbei, you say that uh, you and your team are, are buyers of every dip. I mean, uh, can you give us some insight into that and where exactly you're sort of looking to right now? Look, I think just underpinning our thesis for the equity market is that we're pretty positive in the equity market. We're seeing some sectors a bit more expensive, but with interest rate heading where it is, it's great for asset prices. So, you know, and with the corporates that we've seen, their, um, you know, their, their health is pretty strong. Um, they're very cashed up. They're good at managing margins. Yes, top line will be under pressure. Um, you know, we do think they will maneuver through this period pretty well. Uh, now this is before, um, you know, interest rate cut and the like and China coming back. So, you know, net net on the 12-month view, 
or even two years view, I do think economic reality look pretty good for the corporates. So I will be buying on the dip on, you know, when the market worry about concern about the outlook, um, because I think the underlying fundamental is pretty strong. And for some sectors, as I touched on before, the valuation isn't that expensive. Junbei, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Junbei Liu is Portfolio Manager at Tribeca Investment Partners. Still ahead, South African billionaire Patrice Motsepe is in talks with Vivendi to join its bid for broadcaster MultiChoice. We'll have those details later in the hour. But first, Israel agrees to reschedule a visit to Washington to discuss a planned offensive on Rafah. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. The White House says Israel has agreed to reschedule a cancelled visit to Washington to discuss possible military operations in Rafah. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Paul Wallace. Paul, quite the turnaround. Do we know when this meeting might be scheduled for and, and why the quick turnaround? Hi, Vonnie. We don't know yet, but I presume it will be very soon, maybe even a matter of days, because this is something that uh, both Israel and, uh, and the U.S. can't really afford to delay for much longer. Israel has been saying for several weeks now, almost two months, that it has has to go into Rafah. It claims that it has no option because the city is the last lost um, bastion of Hamas and that it has roughly 8,000 fighters of the Iran-backed group there and most of its senior um, leaders. There is a thinking that nothing will happen until after Ramadan and Eid, so that would mean around mid-April um, before any kind of offensive. Israel is uh, still saying that it will allow civilians to leave the city. There are more than a million of them there. They're seeking refuge uh, from the war, and most of them were told to move there or urged to move there by the Israeli military, um, which was focusing on the north of the Gaza Strip and the, and the center parts um, initially. This meeting will be significant when it happens. The U.S. is going to present um, alternatives to Israel because it doesn't want the Israelis to go into Rafah with a full-on assault. In reality, they probably don't want Israeli forces to go in at all, but I think they realize that Israel is not for budging uh, on this point. Um, Netanyahu and his government, uh, as I said, are adamant that they need to go in. So the U.S. may well um, propose... A, I don't want to call it a light offensive, but something that's not quite uh, a full-on assault on the city. Well, but Paul, I mean, what are these alternatives? Because if Israel and Netanyahu is so, uh, you know, steadfast in, in wanting to invade Rafah, I mean, what are the options here for the U.S. in terms of persuading him not to? That's a good question. And the U.S. hasn't publicized any uh, of its thinking on this matter yet. But broadly, it's probably going to be the U.S. suggesting that Israel goes for something, a more surgical plan, perhaps uh, with the use of special forces um, to more directly go after um, Hamas fighters in, in Rafah rather than using thousands of troops and sort of uh, assaulting the the city from 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 all sides, but that's something I think we won't know for sure until after this uh, meeting in uh, this a previously cancelled meeting in Washington actually takes place. Yeah, and I mean it's fascinating. This does seem to at least move the ball forward, but you know in the other area of Israel where there's fighting right now which is the northern border on the border with Lebanon it did seem to escalate yesterday how bad is it Paul? I think it did escalate we saw uh, civilians being killed uh, both in Lebanon and in Israel uh, the Lebanese authorities say eight civilians were um, were, were killed um, by an Israeli airstrike. One Israeli um, civilian was killed when Hezbollah retaliated. We have seen a lot of these sort of tit-for-tat skirmishes um, since October the 7th and many more of them since the start of, of this year. Yesterday's looks like it's not going to escalate much uh, further, but it certainly adds to fears that Hezbollah and Israel might be 
heading to a full-on conflict. And we cited uh, a po an Israeli poll in, um, in one of our stories yesterday that said almost 70 percent of those surveyed think that there's a fairly high or a very high chance of Israel and Hezbollah uh, um, getting into a, into a full-on war. That's not Israelis saying they want it, but that's um, Israelis uh, surveyed saying they think um, there's, a, there's a good chance of that happening, which makes for pretty grim, grim reading. Yeah, we'll have to pay attention to how that meeting goes uh, in Washington. Bloomberg's Paul Wallace. Paul, thanks as always for joining us. Thanks for that reporting. All right, plenty more still ahead. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in Johannesburg. Let's turn to Turkey. Ahead of this week's local elections, Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has hinted at a possible reconciliation with the country's Kurdish minority. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Turkey economy and government reporter, Beryl Ackman, who's been following this story. So, Beryl, why is the Istanbul vote of particular importance for Erdogan? Walk us through this. Well, for Erdogan, this is a really personal matter because he started his own political life as mayor in the city back in the 1990s. So when the opposition mayor uh, won five years ago in the city, it was really personal for him. And now, uh, if Ekrem Imamoglu, the current mayor of Istanbul, secures the win again, then that will be seen as him becoming the uh, main challenger to Erdogan at the national level. Um, the city is also a massive uh, source of funds for, uh, for whoever manages it. It has a budget of over $6 billion, and it's part of um, the government's uh, um, funding for social aid to shield its residents and citizens uh, from a massive cost of living crisis. So having access to those funds and financing is also critical for the president. Beryl, why has the lira come under pressure ahead of the vote? Huge volatility. Yes, exactly. Uh, there's a lot of pressure that uh, the lira has come under this month, particularly over concerns that the currency might face a bigger route or sharper depreciation after the elections. Uh, that's because um, the policymakers and the central bank has come under pressure and come under criticism for managing the currency. They said themselves that they'll maintain a real appreciation of the lira, uh, ruling out any possible sharp depreciation concerns. And uh, the finance minister, the country's finance minister, also said that this uh, volatility is temporary and will subside after the vote. To manage some of that volatility, the central bank last week raised the benchmark rate by 500 basis points to 50 percent, and that has relieved some of that pressure that we've seen in recent weeks. Beryl, are investors convinced, though, or uh, do they still potentially see a threat to uh, economic policy normalization? I think given Turkey's uh, policy swings, there's always a concern that uh, investors um, cannot rule out uh, permanently. Uh, but this time, uh, they say that it's different. Uh, they don't see any major risk to um, policy continuity after elections, even if the opposition wins. Uh, saying that it will be a very tight race, and if the opposition wins, it will be uh, by a very narrow margin. Uh, but they do say in case of an extreme election outcome, uh, where the opposition would win Istanbul by a very wide margin, then uh, there's, there's a risk that uh, policy could change. Uh, but for now, they, they view this election as a non-event. Beryl, thank you so much. Beryl will be following the election and its outcome throughout the weekend and beyond. So thank you for that. That's Bloomberg's Beryl Ackman there in Istanbul. Let's take a look at markets and particularly Middle East markets. Let's start there, how they fared in yesterday's session. Of course, there's one more session to go as well. The DFM general index down for a second day by about 0.3%, as you can see. Financials were weak across the region, in fact. Uh, Mashrek Bank was the worst performer in the DFM, or at least it was the biggest drag. In Abu 
Dhabi's general index. First, Abu Dhabi Bank contributed most to that decline, which was a third day of declines, down about half a percent. The Dadawal was the bright spot in the region. That was up after three days of declines. It was up by just 0.2 percent, but nonetheless a better sign. And Qatar's QE index, it fell for a third day, just about seven-tenths of a percent lower. In terms of U.S. markets, we are going to take a quick look at where we stand futures-wise in a moment. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. Treasury yields rise after Fed Governor Christopher Waller says there's no rush to cut interest rates while inflation remains a problem. Ready to act, Japan's policymakers warn currency traders they're standing by to stem the slide in the yen. Plus, Israel agrees to reschedule a cancelled visit to Washington to discuss possible military operations in Rafa. It is just past 9.30 a.m. across the Emirates, 7.30 a.m. here in Johannesburg. I'm Jennifer Zabasadja. And I'm Bonnie Quinn in Dubai. And we did see in the U.S. yesterday the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100 make some gains after several days of declines. Luckily, because we are pre-EC... Uh, PCE data Friday and also there's no trading on Friday so it gave the market a little bit of hope and that was all before Chris Waller came to the microphone at 6 p.m. U.S. time on Wednesday evening and said look there is no rush that was the title of his speech he was basically saying he wants to see at least a couple of months more data on inflation that will convince him then to actually allow the rate cycle to start, uh, the rate cutting cycle to start, I should say. Right now we have U.S. futures pointed fractionally lower and the two-year yield up a couple of basis points. We are seeing a little bit of selling bond futures pointing to a little bit of selling in the wake of Waller's comments. But let's have a look at the quarter so far, which actually today is the final day of the quarter. And as you can see, no surprise, Stocks, the All Country World Index, which is represented by that blue bar there, were the best performers across asset in the quarter. Within that, Japan was the best performer, followed by the Euro Stocks 50 and the S&P 500. And then after that, as you see, the blue bar, well, that represents the dollar index. The dollar index, of course, has been strengthening since the FOMC started to push back and push back its rate cutting cycle. And again, Jen, after the Waller comments, we'll be very interested to see what the Treasury market does. Mark Cranfield earlier is saying it's been happening for the last few days anyway, this repricing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And we'll hear uh, from Jerome Powell as well. So we'll see whether or not that uh, makes more of an impact. Uh, Vani, look, let's take a look at what crude is doing right now, uh, seeing upside uh, right now. If we take a look at Brent crude at, at about 86.54, up nearly five tenths of a percent. Also, WTI uh, seeing some upside. And really, you mentioned the end of the quarter. Uh, oil is heading towards a, a really solid quart quarterly gain that's largely off the back of OPEC plus supply cuts uh, that are potentially going to tighten the market uh, and also uh, supported by the geopolitical tensions that we've seen in the Middle East, also demand growth uh, somewhat stalling in, in Asia. But of course, we've talked about the stockpiles and potentially uh, how that's going to balance out uh, what we're seeing in terms of crude. But when we look at Bitcoin right now, uh, it's pulled back slightly from uh, the highs that it saw just a few days ago at about 69,000. But levels are still really leading a number of strategists and investors uh, to, to feel a bit surprised at just how high uh, this rally has gone and how much it's been sustained. We've heard from BlackRock's Larry Fink, uh, who noted his own surprise in the rally that we've seen. We'll see whether or not uh, that continues into the second quarter. Uh, and finally, just speaking of rallies, uh, I think we have to look back at the quarter that was. And these this was a good quarter for a number of assets, as you mentioned. Uh, but these assets really uh, had a solid quarter, Bitcoin, gold uh, and cocoa. And, and so, again, we'll have to see as this is the last trading day of the first quarter whether or not uh, the momentum sustains for these. All right, let's check in on how markets in Asia are faring. Avril Hong is in our Singapore studio. Hey, Avril. Hey, Jen. Yeah, we're seeing a gauge of stocks in the region flat. Chinese equities are leading the way and they are reversing the declines more or less from yesterday. A bit of that pessimism easing off tech media shares. Those are the ones that are outperforming and the Meituan stock is the big boost for the Hang Seng. Uh, today, the Chinese uh, delivery company is getting its upgraded outlook from Moody's from stable to positive. And let's also take a look at what we're seeing 
in the rest of Chinese equities because earnings season is on the way. We have the likes of Volcom, ICBC reporting, and it looks like those bad loan ratios are ticking up. Increasingly, the property crisis is showing up on these state lenders' balance sheets. We also have the troubled developer, Country Garden, reporting later today, and we're expecting those steep losses uh, to show up. Uh, its stock is rising today, but wouldn't read too much into it. It did, after all, yesterday close about 8% lower. So that's what we're seeing in Chinese equities today, guys. Avril Hong, thanks so much. Avril in Singapore there for us. Let's turn to the African region. South African billionaire Patrice Mutsepe is in talks with Vivendi's Canal Plus to join its bid for the broadcaster multi-choice. Bloomberg understands the French media company is looking to make a formal offer early next month. For more on this, uh, we have Bloomberg's Andira Oganga joining us here uh, in our Johannesburg studio. So, Andira, just walk through the significance of Patrice Motsepe joining this bid. Mm -hmm. Patrice is one of the richest black men in South Africa, and him joining the bid then gives Vivendi an upper hand and, and enables them to meet the regulatory requirement in South Africa. There's something called the Black Economic Empowerment Affirmative Action that was introduced to try and promote inclusion in the labor market, and it requires that 25 percent of companies be owned by a black person. So that's the advantage that Patrice brings on board. On the flip side, it serves him also because it diversifies his wealth portfolio. This has started to be one of the biggest BEE deals. Um, in South Africa, and we're expecting that in the next couple of days they're going to put through a formal offer, 129 rands per share, valuing the whole company at $2.9 billion, and uh, a board of directors is going to consider the deal, and then in a two or three weeks we'll know whether they like it or not. So should the offer be accepted, Andira, what would that mean for Vivendi? It's good news for Vivendi because it opens them up to the whole of Africa. Um, if we look at Canal Plus, they have a heavy concentration in Francophone Africa, while MultiChoice has a big footprint across Africa. They'll be introducing them to about 50 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Canal brings on board 8 million subscribers. MultiChoice brings on board 23 million. They're hoping to build up to 50 million, invest in sports, invest in local content. And also they've made it very clear that they want to dip their toes into global streaming platforms. They want to take on the likes of Netflix and Disney. And um, Showmarks is the best avenue to do this because they're the le leading streaming site in Africa, 2.1 million subscribers ahead of Netflix with 1.8 million subscribers. Wow, what a subscriber base that would be. Ondiro, thanks so much. That's Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga in Johannesburg there. And I do want to point out that we are just a few days away from our next Africa Amplified, of course, hosted and conceived of and everything else by Jen Sapasaja. So, Jen, I know you're concentrated on the upcoming elections. You were speaking with some of the candidates this week. Tell us a little bit what we should expect out of next Friday's programme. Yeah, and we're all actually speaking to uh, the opposition candidate uh, of the DA later uh, today. But, Vani, really our focus is going to be on soft commodities. Uh, and the reason is because we've been seeing the price surges that we've been seeing. Uh, and it's not just uh, cocoa. There's a number of other soft commodities that are seeing uh, much higher prices this year. Uh, and the reason why this is a focus is, of course, the African continent, the African region, uh, is, is ripe uh, with farms and, and with a, a plentiful amount of uh, product in terms of soft commodities. Uh, but is this actually trickling down to the people who are cultivating these farms? And what then, where then are these prices going? And so we're going to take a look at it from a few different angles, follow the supply chain, as we say, uh, see how it affects the farmers, see how it's affecting uh, retailers, uh, see how it's affecting consumers and people like yourself who, who eat chocolate. Uh, so that, that's the plan for our next show, which is on April 5th. Yeah, I mean, it is fascinating, isn't it, Jen? Because, you know, you immediately think of sort of how it affects you and prices and so on. But there are so many stakeholders here when it comes to these higher prices of commodities. And, you know, it can lead to so much suffering on the one hand and then profits on the other hand. And it, as we say, always follow the money, right? That leads us to where the uh, answers to all these questions are. So, Jen, remind us when we can see this, where we can see this and what time. Yeah, so the, the, the show airs the first Friday of every month, so uh, there's our full screen showing that. Uh, it is April 5th. That is our next episode. And as you mentioned, uh, Vani, the big question here, too, is whether or not these prices will actually sustain. So we're going to take a look uh, at that and speak with uh, some investors as well to get their insights. All right. Funny more still ahead. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in Johannesburg. The waters off Oman are emerging as a hotspot for ship-to-ship -ship transfers of Russian oil heading to India. Bloomberg ship tracking shows a fourth tanker since February transferred its load of Russian crude this week to a vessel near Oman. Let's bring in our Asia Energy and Commodities editor, Andrew Jaynes, who's been following this story. So, Andrew, why Oman? This is, this is a fascinating story that we have on the terminal now. Hi, Jennifer. Yeah, well, ship-to-ship -ship transfers of oil are pretty common, and they're usually done to uh, mask the origins of cargoes. Um, in the Middle East, the waters of Fujairah are quite a popular uh, destination for this to happen. It also happens in Asia, off the waters of Mal and waters off Malaysia. Oman has been a bit of a popular spot for a while. It's happening off the port of um, Soha in Oman. Uh, but what's the recent development is um, it's happening in particular to Russian oil. Um, and we ship track it. We've sort of tracked ships that, are, that were heading to India and then have turned back from India back to Oman, discharged oil, and then, um, you know, the other ships have have gone to India. Um, and that's happening against a backdrop of increased U.S. scrutiny of the flows. Yeah, it's real oil market forensic accounting kind of uh, work that you're doing here. How might it all impact oil markets more broadly, though, if there is the scrutiny now and, even you know, we're bringing light to it too? In terms of global prices, it's probably not going to have a major impact, but it's certainly important for India. Um, India was a very enthusiastic buyer of discounted Russian oil ever since um, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that trade's become a bit more disrupted recently, though. For a start, the, the discounts it was getting on Russian oil are not uh, as big. A and secondly, as I mentioned, there's been a lot more um, US scrutiny of the flows. We recently had all Indian refiners said they wouldn't take any oil um, carried on Sovcom flot tankers. That's the Russian uh, tanker line. Um, so, yeah, in India, it's definitely definitely sort of uh, it will um, increase uh, costs for refiners there. And of course, India is, is very um, dependent on oil imports as it produces very little itself. Andrew, thank you. We'll have everybody read the story because it is a fascinating look into how oil that really perhaps shouldn't be moving around is moving around. That's Bloomberg's Asia Energy and Commodities Editor, Andrew Jaynes. Well, for months, the Houthis have attacked vessels in the Red Sea in retaliation for Israel's military actions in Gaza, according to the Houthis. A 50,000-ton cargo ship called True Confidence was targeted earlier this month, and three seafarers were killed in that attack in what then became a deadly new era for the international shipping industry. For more on the rescue story, we're joined by Bloomberg's Verity Radcliffe. So it was really fascinating that really nobody had been killed up to that point. There had been so many attacks, Verity. But tell us a little bit about how the rescue of this ship happened post these seafarers dying. Well, it was quite an incredible operation. Um, the the uh, surviving seafarers had to abandon ship immediately, and they were picked up by an Indian warship quite promptly. Uh, but that left the ship um, abandoned, uh, on fire, uh, and uh, adrift. So the salvage crew had to, first of all, find the ship and then clamber up the side, uh, while the, the ship was still on fire, it would come down a little bit, but it was still burning. Uh, and there was barbed wire lining both sides of the ship, uh, making it even harder, presumably installed by the crew as a sort of last line of defence against uh, piracy. Uh, Verity, what happens now? I mean, what is it that you and the team are paying close attention to, especially because we have seen uh, these attacks really escalate over the past few weeks? Yeah, we really have. I mean, these attacks are almost daily, and it's been going on for several months. Um, we're just keeping uh, abreast of what's uh, happening through the uh, Red Sea route. Obviously, a lot of ships are no longer taking that route. Uh, transit is already down 70%. Um, but still, we're interested in uh, any new threats, uh, any increase in the, in the threats in the area. But already, the impact has been quite severe. 
So what happens next? I mean, we've seen shipping costs really, you know, go exponentially higher and there has been a bit of volatility. They're down slightly in some cases now, but what does happen next? Well, like you say, costs is the, the, the big aspect. The other thing is this crews, because crews have to agree to go through these, these areas. Um, and obviously, especially with an attack like this, where seafarers have died, um, crews might not necessarily want to do that anymore. Um, we spoke to a representative from the Philippines who said um, that perhaps crews might not want to, to take these jobs anymore, which is very understandable. Um, two of the seafarers that died on board this ship, they were from the Philippines. Um, so it could have a big impact on crews, which makes um, the, the shipping more logistically difficult, uh, obviously, uh, in, ad in addition to the, the massive cost increases of going around the southern tip of Africa instead of going through the Suez Canal. Yeah, and even broadcasting that they're from a particular place doesn't seem to have m all that much effect because obviously the Houthis you know, are not exact, exact in what they're targeting. Verity, it's a fantastic story and we really, really appreciate it. And again, another great one for everybody to read. That's Verity Radcliffe there. Plenty more is still ahead right here on Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Jennifer Zapasaja in Johannesburg. Nissan is confident its China for China strategy of developing EVs locally is the right one for that market. The company's senior vice president told us more about balancing regional strategy while also competing globally. Regional size is what matters. Uh, China for China at Nissan is uh, something that's working uh, very well, and uh, we will be launching in China. Over the next few years, uh, four new uh, energy vehicles completely developed, localized uh, in, uh, and, uh, and uh, produced, obviously, by our, by our Chinese for China business. And then elsewhere uh, in the U.S., in Europe, uh, or in our Japan business, we're trying to leverage global scale where it works or regional scale where it can. We've got a very big presence in North America, both in U.S., Canada, and in Mexico. And... Uh, and there's enough volume to generate, again, the economies of scale to be competitive. And being competitive just means bringing the cars at the right price for the customers to be uh, very happy with those. The question that Lisa asked, though, I think is a really important one. And it plays into this discussion that we are having. Can you generate global scale when it feels like these markets are becoming increasingly regional? And you mentioned the regional effort. I want to understand, and I'll ask you direct... What happens if we get the former president coming into power and he doesn't just put big tariffs on what's happening in BYD and with Chinese automakers in Mexico? He does it across the board, puts the walls up and shuts everything down. If we shut down the global auto market, it becomes heavily regionalised. Does it change what you do or do you think the market was already moving in this direction? I think the market is moving. I mean, with COVID and the semiconductor crisis, we've been uh, obviously... Uh, much more knowledgeable and careful as to how the logistics routes are uh, set up uh, across the industry. Uh, we've been thinking about uh, dual sourcing and uh, more ensuring of the activities. And so that's a trend that, you know, we want to continue. Building where you sell is uh, a recipe for success uh, in, the, in this industry. And so we are obviously very committed to uh, making investments in North America that will uh, that will. Uh, help manufacture all the vehicles that uh, will be sold here. Nissan Motor SVP Jeremy Pampin speaking there to Bloomberg. Let's get an update now on another blowout Saudi IPO. Shares in Modern Mills, a flour miller, gained 30% in their first day of trading after a hugely oversubscribed public offering. It's the latest sign of strong appetite for Middle East share sales. Let's bring in our equities reporter Farah El Bahrawi. So far, it seems this is another successful IPO and is just proving the point that if you want to make money, just get in on the IPOs in Saudi. Is that the case? Essentially, Vani. I mean, the stock was up the maximum allowed uh, in Saudi Arabia yesterday in its debut. This, this has been a common occurrence. We've actually um, seen most stocks uh, in Saudi Arabia jump 
by the maximum allowed on the first day of trading and continue to hand investors uh, these uh, lucrative returns. Uh, this IPO or this company raised $300 20 million uh, dollars through its listing, but it actually had demand for 40 billion dollars. What? Absolutely, that was oversubscribed by 127 times. So absolutely just massive demand from uh, fund managers. Um, even if other IPO markets open up, fund managers are saying they will still come to the Gulf due to its growth prospects, ma favorable macro backdrop, and these um, very lucrative returns. Wow. And Farah, meanwhile, we're expecting a Kuwaiti company to list in Abu Dhabi soon. Uh, why are you paying attention to this? What are the details here? Well, because this Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti company, Agility uh, Public Warehousing, is actually looking to list its unit, Agility Global, and the Abu Dhabi Securities Exchange uh, by May 2. So um, this is, you know... If, uh, another Gulf company coming to the market here in Abu Dhabi and uh, it approved an in uh, land dividend of um, representing about 49 percent uh, of Agility Global uh, that's 2.6 billion dollars so not small a small company uh, uh, necessarily and uh, Agility said that it will continue to be the controlling shareholder of uh, this new unit um, Agility Global uh, controls a lot of operations and assets for agility, such as Men Menzies Aviation and TriStar Transport. Um, so the logistics sector seems to be growing on the Dhabi Stock Exchange, and this gives investors uh, further exposure to uh, newer and more developed sectors than what we usually see here in the Gulf. And we know you'll pay close attention to that. Bloomberg's Farah al-Bahrawi. Farah, thanks as always for joining us uh, with an update on equities all over. All right, uh, Vani, look, we're paying close attention to another story that's actually one of the top red stories on the terminal this morning, uh, and that's coming uh, from this story about Ozempic, uh, which we've been talking about for several months. Of course, 2023 was a banner year uh, for Novo Nordisk. Uh, but the interesting uh, findings that the study recently came out with was that the, the drug, the Ozempic, could actually be produced for less than $5 a month but a lot of people are paying upwards of $1,000 a month. So this is not adding up here, Vani. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is fascinating how little it costs to produce these drugs that have been life-saving, as you say, for many people. And we know that, you know, obviously, U.S. big pharma spends a huge amount on research and development. And, and then, you know, so the, the reward comes when a drug actually works and then they get the patent for, you know, a long period of time. But you'd like to think that going forward that, you know, perhaps these would be made more affordable. President Biden has done a lot of work on this and gained, you know, some traction with Congress. But, you know, the middle men in, in that scenario lost out a little bit. But you would like to think at the moment you can't keep Ozempic in the pharmacies, right? It's actually quite difficult to get. You know, uh, my brother is actually on it right now and sometimes he has to wait and, you know, it affects his body when he, he waits for it, the next installment. But you would like to think that, like, uh, with the coronavirus, perhaps Big Pharma at some point would, uh, you know, make this available to, to more people for more time. Jen, I do want to say one more thing. We have somebody leaving the team today to go back to London, Ewan Potts, uh, an ace producer or editor and so much much more and we just like to thank him for all of his contributions over the last three months in Dubai. Thanks Ewan. <laughs>